Are you ready, kids? Hello, it's Employee Emilian, and welcome back to SpongeComs. Today's single episode is Season 3, Episode 11, or Episode 51 overall, Spongebob's House Party, which originally premiered on Nickelodeon on May 17th, 2002. And I'm gonna try to look for positive things to say about this episode, because it's far from one of my favorites. I'd probably consider it the low point of Season 3 in a lot of ways. In general, the Season 3 specials are usually your sign to run for the hills, but... There's something particularly off about this one that I want to get into, but I do want to say that obviously everyone who worked on this episode did a good job. I do want to stress that I do admire and respect the energy and dedication that goes into every episode, even ones that I don't really like. No episode is completely without its merits, and there's a lot of good things about this one. I just want to say this because I do know that Jay Linda has liked some of my videos, so I'm a little bit cautious now. I mean, I do want to keep the same sort of tone that I have for the past couple sponge comms, but I do still want to, you know, make them accessible to everyone and keep it up positive thing, even in the face of episodes like this. So, I believe the patchy segments for this one were written by Paul Tibbet, Mark O'Hare, and Meriwether Williams, and they're some people's favorite part of the episode, some people's least favorite. It's always a thing with the patchy stuff. It's always sort of intrinsically tied to the quality of the episode that it comes with. And, yeah, I do feel like they're a little unfulfilling overall, but there are a lot of fun little background bits. It's a fun bits sort of go around this time, because there you see young Serena Irwin as Minnie the Mermaid, and she's about to die, even though she's coming back later. There's Longbeard. Uh, Paul Tibbet appears in the background as a fisherman, and he's also in a band later on. And the funny thing about King Neptune in this particular iteration is that he has a different actor to his voice actor because he's cr his like live action acting is credited to Sergio Risti. His only IMDb, IMDb credit after this is Vegas Dick. So yeah, I think he's had a very prosperous career, but his voice, he's voiced by Kevin Michael Richardson. And it's very strange because I love Kevin Michael Richardson. I think he did a fine job for the line he was given, but he never appeared in SpongeBob again until season 11. So yeah, kind of strange. Also diversity points for being the first King Neptune of color on both sides. So that's pretty cool. It's also kind of weird how this episode is paced because you've got two minutes of Patchy at the start of the episode and then about two or three minutes of Spongebob and then you go back to Patchy and then you go back to Spongebob and then you go back to Patchy one last time. You can kind of see that story progression flip-floppery in Christmas Who, which was the last major Patchy-oriented episode but that was just for the commercial bumper, not for the real deal. Here it's a little flimsier, but I mean, it doesn't make either story worse because you can still watch both on their own. The patchy segments are a little shorter here. They're only about eight minutes in length and the SpongeBob stuff is about 14 minutes long. So it's a few minutes longer than the average of 11 minutes of this era. And I think that kind of has a bit of a negative impact on the episode because it kind of feels a bit sluggish in places. Like, I don't really... F like, it starts off action-packed with SpongeBob doing his groceries and hanging out with old Lou, but this preparation bish is kind of low-key compared to the rest of the episode. It's got a kind of, you know, still a bit of a low-key vibe chilling out with Spongebob, preparing a party. And then we get to see how it all goes horribly wrong. And 
like even the way Patchy introduces it, I just find a bit of a plot hole in because he says it like he's seen this episode hundreds of times. He's preparing his old party and this reminds of him a time that he saw Spongebob do it. But the thing is, this is the premiere. It's hyped up as the premiere of the episode every time you watch it. So what, does Patchy have early access to Spongebob episodes? Probably. You know, he's president of the Spongebob fan club. I can kind of see that. This is probably my favorite visual gag of the episode, just how long this list is that Spongebob has lined up for this party that he's going to throw. And I think that this is a nice, enthusiastic way to show it, unlike the rest of how the episode depicts his party spirit. But enough about that. I do think that the story of the patchy segments is kind of weak, but still a bit better than the story in the episode. Because, you know, it's like this old-fashioned 70s public access thing. That's the whole point of Patchy. It's supposed to be nostalgic for Gen Xers who grew up with these really cheesy, low-budget, you know, live-action puppet shows and stuff on TV. And then you kind of throw these heavy metal birds into it, and it's like, yeah, that makes sense. Like, heavy metal, sort of a timeless genre, but at the same time, it was really hitting the scene in the late 70s, so, you know, there's a sort of timelessness to the way that it's done here. And I do really like all these different, you know, cutaways to different uh, bands that Patchy likes. Uh, Barnac Barnacle Bill and the Seven Seas is one I really like because that was the original name for Barnacle Boy. You know, Steve finally found a way to use that name, and it makes total sense. Uh, the Bird Brains, it's not my kind of music, but I do kind of understand why they'd make the story like this. I don't think the ending's the most satisfying. That's my biggest problem with the patchy stuff here. It's like, you know... They still blow him up and then sing a song about Spongebob and everything's fine. I mean, Patchy's decapitated, but he's okay. Obviously, cartoon logic in a live-action world. But, uh, yeah. All the party guests, they don't really have much to do other than be background extras. But uh, I can't really fault the, you know, the crowd scenes in these segments because... A lot of them are just crew members, so I think it would have been a lot of fun to film this, throw a party. I mean, whether or not Nick wanted there to be more specials or if they felt that some episodes needed some propping up with, you know, patchy stuff to make them more exciting. Whatever the case may be as to why season three got three specials, you know... I can kind of understand why they'd want to do one about something as uplifting as a party. And uh, we're back to the Spongebob segments now. And I gotta say, I do really dig the party atmosphere that Spongebob's cooked up. But this brings us to the biggest, you know, issue with the episode is it's debatably Spongebob's most out of character portrayal up to this point, because you'd think Spongebob of all characters, very ecstatic and extroverted, would know how to throw a good party. But the only real time that you get the sense that he wouldn't throw a good party as himself is with that weird cutaway to his old kindergartner friend. The rest of it kind of feels more suited to a character like Sandy or Squidward who is throwing their first party and doesn't really know how to have the others have fun. I mean, Spongebob, Spongebob wrote the fun song, but at the same time, this episode's depiction of Spongebob is like a total narc who doesn't want everything to be, you know, this freeform party. 
I mean, you could kind of blame the party kit for this, but at the same time, it's not really given much of a justification as to why SpongeBob is so strict with his schedule. He has 175 guests, but only about 11 show up, I think. So I feel like the characterization of Bikini Bottom here is that SpongeBob is kind of a weirdo and not a lot of people want to associate with him. And those who do are Scooter and his very best friends. Uh, fun fact, this is actually one of the last times that Carlos Alazraki voices Scooter. And um, that's the thing. You, you never really quite notice those sorts of things. You don't know what you have until it's gone. Uh... I do feel like this is pretty in character, though. SpongeBob cutting Squidward's cable just to get into the party. And I can see what they're doing for these few minutes, just sort of having the characters do small talk. You know, it's ironic given the partying nature of the episode, and it allows the characters to, you know, breathe, be three-dimensional, just let them you know, be characters with their own personalities bouncing off each other weirdly. And the weird thing about one of these fish is that they change clothes partway through the episode. It's kind of strange. But uh, I think what is kind of disappointing about a party episode like this not really having, you know the characters, you know, get the time to shine after this, because even though there's only like 11 guests, you know, it's a pretty packed party and not every character gets to have some time to be themselves. You, some of them only get one line. All the girl characters, Pearl, Sandy, and Mrs. Puff, they only get one line each. And I think that's kind of disappointing on Sandy's end because she's in all the promo art. She's in the logo for the special and she doesn't really do anything. She's just there to be in the background and also do a really funny dance that I want to bring attention to when it comes up. And a funny thing about the DVD cut of this episode that I'm, you know, using for the sponge comms is that uh, they cut out the little bumpers for, you know, going in and out of the episode when it's airing on television. They're in some copies, they're in, they're not in others. So you're not missing out on much. It's only like five seconds of the French narrator or Frenchie telling you that SpongeBob's house party is going to be right back. Then it's going to be back on. Uh, the Spongebob Christmas special bumpers are also missing. And yeah, here we get to see Spongebob kind of being pretty aggro at a party, which, you know, is another thing that's a bit misleading about the advertisement for this episode, is that he's always having a good time in the VHS and DVD covers and in the promo art that was made for this episode, but that's not really what happens. He's sticking to this tight schedule that no one wants to stick to. And then when the party ramps up, it's all about him getting back inside. And there are creative possibilities there. There are fun things that they can do with SpongeBob trying to get back into his house. But at the same time, it still feels pretty slow paced. Like, it never feels like anything's really going on when SpongeBob is outside trying to break back in. Like, not really a good sense of escalation. But again, I think it is kind of nice to see the characters dancing and having some fun. You see that Sandy dance, that's good. That's good old animation. And another big problem is that we do not see the match. We do not see the match until the last shot of SpongeBob's front door. And then, you know... It's such a cop out, like, yeah. I'm trying to think of if SpongeBob's thrown any parties or been to any parties at the show up to this point. He kind of wasn't in 
the party in scaredy pants until he broke in. Uh, he wasn't too keen on the jellyfish jam when it became like this big throwdown, but they were wrecking his stuff. Maybe, maybe he was just traumatized after that, but yeah. Season three was probably the peak of angry Spongebob because you've got this, you've got Rockabye Bivalve where he's an angry mother, you've got Missing Identity where he spends the last third or so of that episode really getting fed up with Patrick. It's funny in those cases, but here, you know, everything about the episode says that this probably shouldn't be how Spongebob acts, but then he acts like it. And I think that this had a big part to play in why he got so dopey and naive when the show came back in season four. Like, they made him so childlike to counteract episodes like this, where, you know, he's pretty much fighting with the plot. It's also kind of weird Larry's role in this episode to, you know, rummage through SpongeBob's medicine cabinet. It's, yeah, kind of skeevy, but it's only because Larry hasn't been in many episodes up to this point. He doesn't have any real character flaws. Like, later on, in later seasons, they introduce, you know, he projects his own, you know, fitness curriculum onto others. He eats puppies, stuff like that. But way back here, you know, there's not much to go off of. So you've got this nice dude who isn't really SpongeBob's type, but then he just goes rummaging through his medicine cat. It's kind of funny, like the live action shot of him as a cooked lobster is good. Again, I think the best way to describe this episode is that it's less than the sum of its parts. Because a lot of these ideas are pretty fun in concept, but in terms of a larger package, the execution is just, well, kind of disappointing. And each time I go back to it, I'm like, it's season three, how bad can it be? But then, you know, Kind of reminds me how bad can it be. Not the worst of the show has to offer by any stretch. But, again, not something that I'm rushing to go back to. It's not completely without its merits, though. Like, all the little things about this episode are fun to think about in, you know, isolation and maybe watch on YouTube once in a while. But, yeah, there's just sort of an cynical air to this episode, which you don't often see in Spongebob and you don't often want to see in Spongebob, but you've got jokes like this where, you know, Spongebob's almost handcuffed, but then he's pushing one of those, you know, old-timey handcuffs with the neck and then he's sent to jail just for trying to get back into his house. Like, Spongebob did deserve some sort of comeuppance for trying to control the party, but I think that's a bit extreme, you know, sort of characters not acting how they're set up, going to jail, sort of disappointing outside of little bits and bobs here and there. Feels like a Foster's episode. <laughs> I don't really want to, you know, rag on that show too hard, but it does kind of feel like that sort of energy is in this episode, but yeah, there's some fun bits. This, at least, has a sort of silver lining of an ending that Spongebob threw the best party ever by accident. Don't know how they came to that conclusion, but sure. Also, the bunny suit is iconic. It doesn't really add much to the episode, but, you know, it's fun for just a thing that you can throw in. Funny thing about the background music of this episode, though, is... For, like, minutes on end, it plays this party music called The Humpback Hop, which is a great name, and it's a great track, but you'd think they'd vary it up, because it's played for minutes and minutes until Spongebob's caught by the cops. And you think of Spongebob, like, it's always got a variety of music in each episode, whether it be public domain, show tunes, and, you know, dedicated music for the show. So, yeah, you kind of expect more. But, uh, 
patchy segment wrapping up. It's not the worst. I do kind of like this joke about Patchy playing a fife rather than a flute. It's a funny word and it's probably the best setup joke of the whole episode, honestly. And I'm I'm including the water and fire joke or fire and underwater joke. But I think the best thing about this episode is the song the bird brains perform, Underwater Sun. Uh, the visuals for this were directed by Walt Dawn, who mostly wrote and storyboarded for season two, but this was his last, you know, credit on the show. And it's a very weird, surreal music video about Spongebob and his underwater paradise. And I do really dig it. It's very, you know, chaotic and surreal and it just gave them the opportunity to do a lot of weird visuals and even some kind of cool visuals because you've got this little 3D atomic vortex of SpongeBob's that still looks really good today. Like, I know that they're just, you know, static promo images of SpongeBob, but still, it's insanely difficult to get SpongeBob working in 3D and it's a miracle that the movies don't completely remove all the appeal. And that's a good old Monty Python reference. And there was a keep on trucking reference at the start of the episode with that little drawing one of the staff members did. It's also kind of funny how both SpongeBob segments in this episode, both the main party pooper pants story and the underwater sun music video end with Spongebob turning off a lamp. Like he turns it off on Gary's head once he's had the party of his life. And then here when he's going to sleep. And as much as I love doing these sponge comms, I always want to, you know, either invite someone on who worked on the show, you know, pipe dream, I get it. But either that or hear some commentary tracks from the people who worked on it because you know, I do really want to hear from Tom Kenny how many hours he had to spend in that bucket getting kissed by those f feather brains. But uh, there we go. I found some good things to say about it. I've got that off my bucket list. And that was SpongeBob's house party or party pooper pants. My question of the week for you last week was, what's your favorite Nicktoon besides SpongeBob? And I got plenty of answers especially from Bryce Fawn 2001. Uh, his were My Life as a Teenage Robot, Hey Arnold, Cat Dog, Rocco, Angry Beavers, Early Fairly Odd Parents, Jimmy Neutron, Cat Scratch, and Glitch Ticks, Nickelodeon's Been Your Main Network, Jack McGinn has to go with Rugrats, Dashiell Rose says Danny Phantom. You know, she likes the jokes and the characters. They're pretty good jokes and characters. Rebel Friend, Hey Arnold, Magnificent SMFA, Invader Zim, and The Doot Man, Avatar The Last Airbender. All pretty good choices. My question time for you for in two weeks is, what are your favorite patchy segments? Because they're not ever really considered highlights of the show, but I guess with the party atmosphere and the good song, this could be someone's favorite. I don't know. I mean, my favorite used to be the ones for Spongebob BC, but then, I don't know, Feral Friends kind of worked for him. And in two weeks, I'll be back with the sweet and sour world of Chocolate with Nuts and Mermaid Band and Barnacle Boy 5. Sweet and sour, chocolate and lemons. Get it? Goodbye for now.